with all my might. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I will leave it. That'll save me from writing. Okay. Now, let me, let me just get you oriented uh, to where we are and what, we get, what we're dealing with. <clears throat> My, my purpose for this, however long I'm going to do this instruction, is to get you to understand that when Jesus declared his ministry right here in Luke chapter 418, when he declared that, this was not something he got down on a weekend and fasted and paid, prayed to receive. This was ordained of God. It was so ordained of God, so ordained of God, what God did was take an elderly woman that could not have children, and she was given the ability or the anointing to have children, to have a child. This, listen, this was so ordained of God that God took an elderly woman, gave her the anointing to have a child. She had a child called John the Baptist. And he was solely set aside to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, to prepare him to preach this message. Now, and the thing that we must realize before I pray and we get in the word, we must realize Think about it, all you folks that have read the Old Testament. How many, how many people in the Old Testament that God used to open up blind eyes, to heal lepers, to set captives free, to cause the lame to walk, and etc. How many people was used like that in the Old Testament? I want to think, think about it. How many? Can you think of any? Can you think of any? Old Testament. Old Testament. Elijah, they were given, but it, it never was manifested in one person. You know, Elijah came along and did mighty miracles of God. Elisha came on and did twice as much what Elijah did. But nobody in the Old Testament did what Jesus was professing he was going to do. No one. It was spoken of that there was someone coming to do this. But nobody did it. Now, the reason why I know that, I don't, I, I'm not saying that because I've studied it, etc. The Bible says that. Not only does the Bible say it, but Jesus said it. Jesus said has any, has you ever heard of anyone doing this? No. Now, now, when he asked him, have you heard, ever heard of it? He wasn't talking New Testament. He was talking Old Testament. Okay? No one. This is critical. This is the ministry of the kingdom. Do you hear what I'm telling you? This is the ministry of the kingdom. This is the ministry not only you are involved in, but that God has anointed you to do. This is that ministry. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time of teaching and ministry to your people. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing to do it. Thank you for anointed ears and hearts open to receive. Lord, may we speak. May I speak with clarity and, Father, with truth. From you, Holy Spirit, your presence in this place to open up our hearts for truth. Now, thank you, Lord, as the truth of God is operating in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Now, I want to go to uh, put up Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. And I want all, all of us to read from verse 1 to 6. We're going to all read it. And this begins our time. I have it up here. But the title of my message is Freed from Bondage. Now, before we read it, I want you to catch another, another major theme 
a major theme on the heart of God. Not just a major theme in the Bible, but a major theme on the heart of God is for his creation, which is us, to be free. Now, never in bondage. You will see wherever God's people have been in bondage, God himself has worked to free them. He has never produced or said anything from heaven to bring people in bondage because he wanted them to be free. Adam and Eve was free in the garden until what? They sinned. And sin brings you under a a master itself. Now, listen, this is the heart of God. God never wants his people to be in bondage. It actually works out, and I want you to catch the seriousness of it. It actually works out that God never wants his people to be dominated or enslaved. Never. Never. God was so gracious that, what, 400 years or so, he prophesied about how his people was going to be in bondage and how he was going to free them. He was going to bring them out. Because he always wants his people to be free. Okay? You remember when, uh, when Moses finally accepted the call as a deliverer and he went down in Egypt and he went before Pharaoh, threw his staff down and turned to a snake and all that stuff. Well, Pharaoh responded, responded in a sense of greater bondage for the Israelites because he felt like, hey, y'all don't have nothing to do. Okay, make brick without straw. And so they had to now go grab that straw and and work harder, more bondage. What What did God tell Moses when he called him? He said, I have heard, I have heard the groanings of my people in bondage. I've heard them. God never wants his people in bondage. Never. He doesn't want you in bondage to nothing. He wants you free. Sin will bring you in bondage into several areas. He wants you free. He wants you free. Say free. Free. Say freedom. freedom. Okay, you're going to see that in this message. You're going to see that Jesus outlines all the troubles, afflictions, and maladies that will plague human beings, but he says that he has been anointed to free you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, y'all ready to read? All right, let's, we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. Ready? Let's read. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 2. Paul say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith. Amen. Say amen. 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 All right. This passage of Scripture focuses on, first of all, it talks about Christ setting them free. It, it really, it was focusing on the Galatians and a particular problem that they were having. But it's good for us as we use it and grab from it uh, the, the spiritual nourishment that the Lord is bringing us into. He talks here about a people that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ 
and accepted him and nothing else. And now there are people that come in on the scene that says you got to have the Lord Jesus Christ plus you have to be circumcised. Now, there was no big thing in circumcision per se, but it what, it's what was re, it represented among the Israelites. It represented something. It, it set them aside in the Old Testament. It set them aside as God's people. Now, now at, after Christ uh, died, buried, resurrected, and ascended, and, and ushered in the new covenant, that old covenant had been laid aside. And he was trying to tell them, you cannot try to put the requirements of the old covenant and the new covenant together to try to be something. Because the new covenant is master and better than the old covenant. It says that in, in the first few chapters of the book of Hebrews, that the new covenant is a better covenant than the old covenant. Amen. 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 Now, the new covenant was a covenant of grace, God's favor. How many of you like favor? We all like favor, but sometimes we have an attitude about it. We don't fully understand it. Sometimes we reject favor when we feel like when we feel like we're not worthy of it. Well, what in the world do you think favor is? <laughs> oh God, I just can't accept that, Lord. You're just too good. I can't. Why? I mean, I'm telling you, that's how sometimes we act. What do you think favor is? Favor is giving you something that you don't deserve. And that's what this whole thing is about. It's not trying to get you to the point, get you to the point of satisfying something so that now you can stand in something and be somebody. Because I'm telling you, the salvation of the Lord is too great. There's no price that you can pray, pay for it. But he does it by his grace, by favor upon your life. And when you stand in that, when you believe in that, when you trust in that, then you stand as righteous as anybody. Amen. Come on, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Okay, now, so... Put up 2 Corinthians 3.17. It's important that we understand this, this before I move on. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Put it up in the Amplified. Hallelujah. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty emancipation from bondage, true freedom. Say freedom. freedom. Listen to me now. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is resident and operating, there is liberty. Amen. Say liberty. liberty. Now I'm going to say it again because we need to get this ingrained in our spirit. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This says emancipation from bondage, true freedom. Say true freedom. True freedom. Okay, uh, where, again, where the, Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The state, I got it as the state of being free. Okay? Now, say, I'm, well, I'm going to put this up so you can be copying it. This will be the new stuff. When, when we talk about being free where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there is no more domination. There's no more domination. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? God's original purpose for human beings that they be dominated by nothing, that they be their will, they serve him in love, dominated by nothing. Now, you have to understand that that domination, to dominate somebody, okay, to dominate somebody, you're going to have to do something to them to dominate them. Do you hear what I just said? One of the ways that that happens is fear. Fear. If I can get you to fear in a certain area, I can dominate you. This is why the enemy works so hard at getting you to be fearful. Okay? Fear. 
Fear will help domination. Fear will help domination. Okay? Now, here's another, another one. Manipulation. Manipulation. Now you say, how in the world does manipulation help dominate someone? Well, what happens is, what is manipulation? What is manipulation? A, 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 a sense of, and you see, there's another word that go along with domination. Control. Now you have to understand that these are serious words to God. God himself will never manipulate you. Will never try to coerce you into doing what he wants. God will not do that. The devil will. The devil will use these tactics. See, this is the difference between the God, between God and the devil concerning what we are talking about, uh, dealing with domination. God never wants to dominate you against your will. The enemy will try and do that, and he'll try to do it by fear and by manipulation because he wants control. Okay, all right, watch this. Remember, remember, you, you remember all the stuff dealing with Jezebel, okay? Jezebel wanted control. She wasn't necessarily after a frontal attack on whoever was in charge. She wasn't necessarily, at, you know, at first, she wasn't necessarily about that. She wanted control. And to get control would use manipulation. There's another word asso associated with manipulation. Give me another one, you think. Starts with a D. Oh, we already got that. God always deals with truth. He's never going to deceive you. Now, come on, are you, are you catching a, a sense of where God is and where the enemy is? The enemy will always try to, he has to deceive you to, get, to dominate you. He has to deceive you to control you. He will try to manipulate. Let me show you something. Listen, you see this word manipulation? And let me write on the side of it, people. People... People that have a problem with trying with, with either people pleasing or approval of people or want to be in control of people will use manipulation. Will try to coerce you into doing what they want you to do. Now, can I say this in I wish I had time to discuss it. I don't. You've already heard me say that when you're dealing with a husband and a wife, remember this, remember this, remember this. The husband have authority. The wife have influence. Remember that. Now, which one of these, now not husband or wife, but authority and influence, which one of those words is more likely to have associated with it this word manipulation? Why influence? Because of influence. Because it is, it is a person that is trying to get you from the position you are into another position. From the attitude you are into another attitude. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? That's, that's why this is important. This is important for wives to understand what God has empowered them to do. A woman is already in a position and a place because of, uh, because of the desire of her husband and who he is. She's already in a place to influence him. And it's very important what you do when your husband becomes stubborn. 
Now, I'm not teaching on marriage or anything, but I'm giving you some truth. It's very important. Do not get into manipulation when he doesn't want to do what you want him to do. Don't do that. Stay away from it. You could, you could plead with him. Uh, you can pull out the, 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 I call it the bazooka statement on him. It's a bazooka statement. It is something that, that will blow up a relationship as quick as possible. What is the bazooka statement? Anybody remembers that? Joe, you remember? What is it? That's the bazooka statement. That's what an influencer is armed with. Sis Diane, you are armed with that. Miss Latoya, sis right here, you are armed with that. Yeah, you say it may not do any good, oh, but it does plenty of harm when you use it and it don't work. It does a lot of harm. Not, on, not in the heart of the man, in the heart of the woman. Because, okay, he's not going to do it because I ask him if he loves me. Well, that means he don't love me. Y- y'all listening to me. I'm not, I'm not talking about trying to affect him. I'm talking about what's going to affect you. That, that's a bazooka statement. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. But you must understand, don't listen. An influencer has influence from God because, this. now you got to catch this, this is totally spiritual, because God has called you wife the same thing he calls himself, helper. In the psalmist, God calls himself a helper. That's what he calls you, wife, a helper. And you have to have influence because he has authority. God will give you some details, but he's got the authority. And you must always stand in righteousness with your influence. Enough on marriage. Praise the Lord. You got that free. Okay, back to this. You got you to gotta be careful of being a people pleaser. Because why, why, why does a people pleaser come into this? Because a person will do whatever it needs, whatever they need to do to try to please people. Listen, that's manipulation and deception. Okay? A pleaser and then approval. Okay? Approval addiction. You don't want to be into that because you're dealing with deception and making yourself out to be something so that somebody will be pleased with you. Why do you think God set the system up for you to please him and not people? And when you please him, he'll give you favor with him and with people. Y'all with me? Sound like y'all, y'all with me. Y'all sound, sound like, okay. There's another word under here. You see, God doesn't want you to be dominated. Here's another word. I think I'm spelling it right. Constraint. He doesn't want you constrained. He doesn't want you hemmed in. He doesn't want you to say in your heart and mind, I can't go anymore. I can't do nothing. No. No. That's not for you. He wants you free. He doesn't want you constrained. Yeah, you'll go through a season where you're operating in something and it feels like you're constrained, but it's only for a season so that you can get something where you are. God will move you on. Everything about you concerning your physical body talks of no constraint. Your hair will grow as long as it'll grow. If you don't clip your nails, your toenails and fingernails, they'll grow as long as you let them grow. Ah. You grow, you, you cells die and produce new cells. I'm telling you, there's no constraint. God doesn't want you in constraint. When his people are in constraint, God is a mighty warrior to come on the scene to free you and tear down the boundaries that have you boxed in. Boxed in. He doesn't want constraint. Let's see what I got written here. No longer domination. A person is not dominated or feel under constraint. Now, listen, 
in a number of languages, the concept of freedom is expressed as a cancellation of control and domination. A cancellation, let me just encircle this and put right here, cancel. Cancellation of domination and control. A cancellation of domination and control. And Jesus is not freeing us to bring us under another form of bondage, okay, uh, et cetera, but to make us free from bondage. Okay, now, when we talk about freedom, we talk about this is the ultimate choice of God. The reason why we know that is Jesus now has come to the place to begin his ministry. And what does he declare? Put up uh, Luke. Um, I tell you what, Luke 4, we'll start at verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Okay, just freeze that. Just stay right there. Okay. Now, this was not just a cursory moment at that time that Jesus just decided, I'm going to go to the synagogue. And I'm going to take the scroll and I'm going to just flip it open and whatever it opens to, that's what I'm going to read. What, that's not what it was about. This moment was ordained. This moment was ordained. Are you listening to me? This moment was ordained. The moment was ordained. He went to his own peeps as we talked about. Amen. And, and so uh, the moment was ordained. This moment was prophetic. It was prophetic because what he's about to say is in Isaiah chapter 61. Part of it also in Isaiah chapter nine. Not going to go there. <clears throat> but remember, keep these things in mind as we move forward. Remember that number one is that this wasn't a cursory moment. It was ordained. Remember that Jesus was speaking concerning the Old Testament of what it said. This is what he went back to. Okay? Now, let's, uh, let's go on, and, and I'm going to read through it to, I guess, verse, uh, maybe verse 19, no, 20. Uh, sorry, 21. I'm going to read all the way to 21. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to do what? To heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty who? Okay. All right. Okay. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then the last verse, and he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now understand something. They knew this scripture. That's one. Two, they knew that only the Messiah can speak this scripture. OK, now they, they probably could they probably had spoken it, but they only could speak of it is in Messiah coming one day. You know, the Messiah is going to come and the spirit of the Lord is going to be upon him and, and the Lord is going to anoint him to preach the gospel to the poor. And they could say that, but he's not saying that. He's saying, because I have come and I have written and read this to you. This scripture is fulfilled in your ears because I'm him who is talking about. 
Now, when <clears throat> it was custom to go into the synagogue to read from the scroll, but then to sit down and talk about it. And whoever did the reading would, would you know, open up their hearts and they would say whatever God put on their heart. That's what he did. After he read it, he sat down and everything was still. Kind of like y'all are. You know? But it was still because they knew what he read and they couldn't believe the words that he said. They couldn't believe it. You know, if you go in the next verse, man, they were, they were overjoyed until he began to, you know, ex expose on what it was all about. The, you know how the scene ended. The scene ended where they were, they were going to throw him off the cliff. Who do you think you are reading this messianic thing? We know you. You were brought up in the midst of us. This is for the Messiah. Preconceived ideas. Okay. But now, I, I, I want you to see something and I want you to understand something. John the Baptist came preparing the way of the Lord. What did he come preaching? He came preaching repentance. Okay? The first thing out of Jesus' mouth, as he spoke in another place, he said, repent. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. Now, let's, let's, I, I mean, I'm still in a, in a place of where I'm just trying to give you some overview of what we're dealing with. Okay. Um, so, in his message, the first thing he starts with, he said the spirit of the Lord was upon him. Okay? That's what he said. Go back to uh, 18. Let's, let's walk through this a little bit. The spirit of the, of the Lord is upon me. Okay? The spirit of the Lord. We looked at before on Wednesday night, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, where it talks about uh, uh, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of counsel and knowledge and uh, wisdom and strength uh, and those things and the fear of the Lord. That's where it does in Isaiah and and then Isaiah 42, we talked about a spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has anointed me. And we talked about anointing. We talked about anointing. We talked about what that was about. Look at Acts 10, 38. And uh, I'm going to just, just for a minute or so, I want to talk about anointing. Acts 10, 38. Yeah, Acts 10, 38. Okay, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. What was he anointed with? With the Holy Spirit and power. Who, what did he, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. Anointing comes, anointing is the power of God for a special work, a task, a job, a ministry, an office, or calling. Anointing does not come if you have made a decision, you're going to sit down and not do the work. Okay. Anointing comes for a specific purpose. It is the power of God that comes up on you to do what God is calling you to do. You are anointed for the work. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm anointed for the work. Now, what is the work? See, whatever the work is, what is the work? You are anointed for the work. Some people think that the anointing is just for a preacher. Okay, watch this. Watch this. In the Old Testament, I want you to answer it. In the Old Testament, who was anointed? The king? Prophets and priests. That was it. You're listening to me. Unless you was a king, and there was only one king at a time, okay? Could be many prophets. Okay? And priests, they were anointed under the old covenant. But in the new covenant, every believer is anointed because every believer has a calling. All I'm doing is functioning in my calling. Are you listening to me? Amen. Let's just say the Lord calls his Carolyn to do nursery. She's anointed to do nursery. 
Okay? When she functions in her calling, okay, here I am, pastor, I'm functioning in mine, and she's functioning in her. I don't necessarily hold a higher position in heaven than she is because it's all based on what God has called you to do and function in. We classify people, thereby devaluing people. And that's why this is so important for you to understand. That you are anointed, whatever God has called you to do, you are anointed to do it. I'm just functioning in mine. Mine happened to be before you to teach you and minister to you and care for you as a shepherd. That seems to and is important. But it's just important if God anointed you to sing. See, I get the strange feeling that y'all don't believe that. I mean, because, uh, you know, I mean, it ain't exactly, you know, cast a thousand of people in here, and I don't just hear much from you. Y'all all right? Y'all want me to preach to y'all to stand y'all up so I can preach to y'all? Because I'm telling y'all, you know, hey, I'm here to give it to you. And I'm, I'm going to do my very best to give it to you. I want you to understand it. That's why I pull out the board so you can see it. And I, I want to make it clear. If it's not clear, Pastor, that's not clear. You can say that this morning. Not every Sunday morning you can say that. But I want you to understand this. It's important. It's important. It's important that you get it. It's important. Okay, see? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good. Notice, because he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power, he did what? He went about doing good. Guess, guess who else ought to go about doing good? You, you hear me? Not doing bad. Doing good. Not harboring people to sin, but doing good. We went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Listen, not only doing good, but helping people be delivered. Come on. He was manifested to tear down the works of the devil. You're, uh, you were saved to do the same thing. Because it's going to be the devil that's going to oppress you. It's going to be the devil that try to bring you in bondage. You, you're listening to me. To control you and dominate you. Listen, can, let me go to a place here. Let me just put this down. I want to go to a place. I want you to understand something about demonic forces. Listen to me. They hate to be outside of a body. They are looking for somebody to operate through. They, 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 they are looking for somebody. They cannot do it. They cannot do it unless you give them authority. Now, you got to understand. You got to understand. Where did that come from? Why can't they do it? Why can't, why can't the devil just kill you? He, do, he doesn't have that authority. You, are you listening to me? I, I don't think we've gotten that. He doesn't have that authority. Because trust me, if he had it, he'd have done it. Amen. He's got to get the authority from you. And what he has to do is somehow another, somehow another, some way, form, a situation, he's got to get you to sin. Because if he can get you to sin, he know that God can't tolerate sin. He knows that. And what he wants to do is if he can get you to do that, then it's going to give him some legal right to come in and to do things. Now, there are habits and things that we do that are not good and they're not necessarily demonic, but you keep doing them, they jump on them because they're trying to get a place in your life. And, but look, now you got to look at it for what it's worth. The Lord Jesus came so there's no more domination or control in your life. Have any of you ever been under the control of food? Raise your hand. 
Now, y'all know what I mean when I say control of food. I don't mean that, oh, pastor, I'm hungry all the time. No, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about an absolute desire for food even when you're full. Consistently overeating. Not satisfied until you overeat. Now notice, those things will work to gain some control over you. You with me? See, it's, I'm telling you guys, it's all about control and domination. And if the enemy can deceive you to try to get that, he will. If he can lie to you, he will. And what has to happen is you have to believe the lie. That's crazy, you know. Believe the lie. The Lord is vehement to give you an answer to stay away from that. But he can't make you accept it. But you know why he can't make you accept it? Because he is never in your corner to dominate and control you. The Lord will not do that. You have to accept it. You have to accept either the lie or accept the truth. God's not going to force it on you. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I've said, Lord, Lord, please, you need to force this on me. I'm not getting it. Didn't happen. I had to still believe the Lord in faith about what he said. Because he is never going to, listen, come on. Everything that the devil does is to dominate and manipulate to keep you controlled. Control, to con control from what? From doing the will of God. The devil knows that you are a weapon against him. The devil knows that you have a destiny in God. The devil knows that souls will hear what you have to say. The devil knows that however God has delivered you and brought you out, you'll be able to share that with somebody. He knows that, so he wants to shut you up. He wants to control that. And he will manipulate you. He will constrain you. Are you listening to me? Yeah. This is a good verse to, to walk in. Jesus was anointed with power and the Holy Spirit, but he went about doing good. If what you're doing ain't blessing people, stop doing it. I'll say it again. Praise the Lord. If what you're doing ain't blessing people, stop doing it. Amen. Are y'all listening to me? Amen. Why keep doing it if it's not blessing people? Amen. Why, why keep doing it if it's not bringing people out of where they are into where they ought to be? Why, 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 if it's not bringing a person in and help to free them, stop doing it. But one thing I found out about a person in bondage, they love to get other people in bondage. If you ever walk up on your buddies doing crack, trust me, they want you to do crack. Do they not? Somebody, come on, I, I've never done crack. Somebody tell me, is that true or not? But Joey, I mean, I'm, I'm not calling you the, the crack expert. <laughs> But talk to us. Hallelujah. You know? All right, let's, let's bring it down. We. Sure. Why? Why? Why you got to pay? Why you got to pay? Because they look. They want to control you. They know if they get you in for free. Are you listening to me? Have y'all ever gotten in the mail these things with these free dinners, you know? You come and they pick the most exclusive restaurant. Come, we just want to share with you a five-minute presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Now, by law, they can't force it on you, but they feed you real good and they put the pitch on you real good so you make the decision whether you're going to buy a timeshare or not. Man, I remember me and the wife was young. I, I don't, we hadn't been married 
a matter of fact, if I'm thinking correctly, we probably was either had no kids or one which was just a kid, and we got that call. Drove all the way to New Orleans. <laughs> one, of these, one of these things. Now listen to what I'm telling you now, okay? And man, they fed us real good, and the pitch was just so good. And guess what we did? We jumped right on that thing. I, big time. Signed up. Drove back home. Started reading all the fine print. Told my wife. I, and I looked at her and I said, we done done a bad thing. Oh, no. Listen, these principles are not principles that business people come up with. They are principles that come from the pit of hell to manipulate and grab a hold of people and dominate them and control them. The cash cow places use the same thing. Oh, y'all not listening to me. They use the same thing. Here they are. They butter you up, butter you up so you'll get, listen, they wait until you get in a tough place. They know you're not coming into them because you're flowing with money. They know when you walk in their door, you desperately need it. They are playing off of a need, most of the time, an uncontrolled need in your life. When you are out of control, you better be careful at how you try to control something and deal with that thing that's out of control. So your spending is out of control. And you go to them. It's a perfect time for them to bring you in bondage. And, and you don't think of it as bondage because, hey, I just need $500. You get the $500. You got to pay $900 back to them. And when you finally wake up and you see that, you think it's a travesty. But you signed it. And if you didn't have discipline to use the $500 that you borrowed to work yourself out of it, well, guess what? You are in a deep hole because you're going to try to pay, pay. Then you're not going to pay. Then they're going to start hounding you. And finally, you're going to get down to where you owe them $200. And all of a sudden, says Carolyn, these vehement people that was going to take away your children and your home and your job and everything. So you pay them back. They switch when the balance is low. Oh, how you doing? We glad to see you. Oh, we see that you paid most of your balance down. We got some more money for you. Oh, y'all let domination control trying to manipulate you into trying to keep you in bondage don't you see that in our life there are certain things that bring us in bondage money or a lack of discipline with money is one of those things my wife and I made a big mistake honestly we had I don't know I think eight credit cards Maybe more. And I don't know how I got a hold of it, but I got a hold of the word. The best thing to do is consolidate all this stuff. Because I, when it came down to paying bills, it was, it was like a funeral in my house. I was sad. The wife was sad. I had to run all over the place and pay everything. And we had to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul and figure this out and figure that out. It was just a headache. And, and so this stuff was wearing on me physically. So what was, see, I'm telling you, that's why the Lord comes to set you free. Because all this stuff will come in and try to dominate you. So then the enemy will introduce something to you at that moment so you can grab onto it. It's all about understanding that you have authority in your life. Don't relinquish the authority because time gets hard. Stay in the Lord. Fight to stay in the Lord. Do everything you can to fight and stay in the Lord and stay in his principles. You see, this is why it's important for you to understand. The whole thing is based on you giving up your life for Christ. Because when you understand that he has your life, whether you've messed it up or not, that he has your life. And so we consolidate all that stuff. I don't know. I think I was paying $1,500 a month on bills. It probably was more, but I'm 
foot long number. And when we consolidated, it dropped down to like $700, $800 a month. Okay, if I was paying $1,500 minus $800, which leaves you with what? What's, the, what's what? My, $1,500 minus $800 leaves what? Ask me what I did with the $700. Huh? Spend it. Went out and made more credit card bills. Are y'all listening to me? Now, how foolish is that? Let me show you how terrible it is. I had some credit cards in there that, that were under $500. I would have paid those things out in four months or less. And so now, now, because I've consolidated, I got 10 years to pay on it. Are, are y'all listening to me? And it was all rooted in a sense of thinking that I'm going to perish. Remember, remember how fear operates. And it was thinking that I'm going to perish, that I'm going to go do something to relieve this pressure. You better be careful. And I did that. And I'm telling you, we pay. And everybody now that I talk to, if I can, if I can talk to a tree, I'll tell a tree, don't consolidate your loans. <laughs> uh, please don't do that. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Because probably where you are, you got there by being undisciplined with money. That's what you need to do. You need to gain discipline with it. And just getting back in the marriage, in your marriage, whoever is the better person with money out of the two of you, that's the one that needs to have the authority in it. Why is that? Okay, let's just say it's the wife. The wife does better with money, okay? Well, so if she works the money and does what's needed, does that not benefit you, husband? Don't act like the south side of a northbound horse. Don't act like that. You'll figure it out, missionary. I'll get it to you. Because, uh, you know, us guys, we got pride. Pride? Why would we have pride when we got somebody alongside of us to make our household better? Why would we want to do that? Sacrifice it for pride, for ego. Oh, y'all, y'all, I'm, I'm not talking, talking to any of y'all. Y'all not like that, see? None of you guys are stubborn and all that stuff, right? Praise the Lord. But I, I'm, listen, I'm talking about that the whole plan of the enemy is to get you under control and dominate you. The whole plan of God is to get you from under that and get into liberty. Freedom. Freedom. That's, the whole, that's the whole plan. Don't cooperate with the devil. Yes, don't cooperate with the devil. Thank you, Mr. Kia. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't cooperate with him. Don't cooperate. Remember, the Lord wants you in liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Listen, the spirit of the Lord is the spirit of truth, meaning he's going to establish you in truth. The devil hates the truth, and he'll twist it. But if you stand in the truth, he can't get you. He can't get you. Because he's a liar and there's no truth in him. You can tell the devil's lying when he moves his lips. Why would you want to recite something that the devil told you? It's a lie. Why are you talking lies? Why don't you talk promises? Why don't you talk words? Oh, hallelujah. Okay, okay. Oh, <laughs> I, I got, oh man, I got about another hour and a half. Hallelujah. I 
I tell you what, I tell you what, come on, we're going to, we're going to, we, we not, we, I'm going to save the rest for you. Hey, I'm pastor here. I could do that. <laughs> okay. All right. I can do that. All right. Amen. But I am. This is, this is what I want to close with. Okay. And, and listen, I, 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 and I forgot this, guys. I wanted to tell those of you that, that, uh, that came with us to 4C ministry on last Sunday. I don't know about you, but I had a great time. It was a great time. It was a good word for them. It really was a good word for them. I thank God for it. Thank God for it. Uh, amen. Hallelujah. Now listen. Listen. I'll, I'll get to the breakdown of this because I, I, I need to get to I need to get to the preach the gospel to the poor. You need to understand all these things all these things that Jesus said are pivotal in our freedom. Pivotal. To staying free. I'm talking about pivotal to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, uh, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised or oppressed. All these things are critical in what we go through as human beings. But he came and he was anointed to break these things off of us. Put up Galatians 5.1 for me real quick. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Amen. What's coming for us? And ought to be, it ought to already be operating in your life. It's liberty. It's coming for us. Okay. And, and I noticed that some of you are sharing with your family, which is testifying that you know what freedom is and you know that they are in bondage and they need to be in that conference. Amen. Now, the command goes out and says, don't, don't, don't be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Don't be in, don't go back to bondage. Huh? Don't go back to bondage. Can I ask a question? I'm going to ask a question. Why does a, uh, a, a woman over here that has an abusive husband and et cetera, and let's just say he goes off the scene, he dies or whatever, and she looks for another abusive husband? Why is that? Why is that? She is. She's in, she's in bondage. She's in bondage to not, not for people pleaser, et cetera. She's in bondage dealing with herself, thinking that this, she needs this to be validated. No, she doesn't. This is why Jesus Christ is such the main figure to free people. Religion don't free you. Y'all kind of quiet. Religion don't free you. All it does is bring you under some laws and et cetera and get you to think that if you just keep doing that, you're all right. Okay, I'm close. Uh, put up verse 19 of Luke chapter 4. We're going to close with this. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be back to it again. The last thing that Jesus said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The next verse says he didn't close the book and sat down. He didn't finish the verse because if you go look at it in Isaiah 61, you'll see that it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of God's vengeance. He purposely stopped here because he was opening up. He was opening up a season, a time, an age of God's favor upon humanity and it's still open okay watch this John the Baptist is in jail you'll see that once John the Baptist gets in jail it's almost like Jesus now is empowered it is it, it, it really is true because John the Baptist was at the end of him of his calling of preparing so what does John do John sent one of his disciples to ask Jesus are you the one or should I look for another? And what did Jesus tell him? 
Go back and tell John that the blind see and the lame walk and the dead are raised and, and, and miracles are being performed and healings be performed. Tell him that. Let him know that I am the one. You don't need to look for another. I'm the one. And how do you identify the one? You identify the one of what he said here. Preaching the gospel to the poor. Opening up blind eyes. The lame to walk. I mean healing people. He went about doing good and healing. This is his ministry. Hallelujah. Now listen. Listen to me. 2 Corinthians 6.2. Put it up. Want us all to read it. 2 Corinthians 6.2. We all read it. Hallelujah. Ready? Read. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You could have said that 50 years ago. You could have said it 60 years ago, and it's still good. Still good. It's still good. This is an acceptable time. For the Jews, it was called Jubilee. Say Jubilee. Jubilee. Oh, we understand Jubilee, man. We dance in it. Oh, you know, we understand the joy. Why is Jubilee so joyful? Why? See, this acceptable year is Jubilee. Now, a jubilee, listen, a jubilee year is the 50th year. Sabbath was seven. That's seven, okay? The seventh day, a seventh year was a Sabbath year. So seven Sabbath years, okay? The next year, which is 50, seven times seven is what? 49. The next year, which is 50, which made it jubilee year. Jubilee is also tied into the day of Pentecost. Okay, they're all tied together. God does something in this, and you got to understand. But Jubilee, listen to me now. Jesus said, the last thing he said, I came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, why is Jubilee so important? Jubilee has three basic provisions. And next time I'll write this up here. Three basic provisions. The freeing of all slaves, one. The cancellation of all debts, two. The return of all land according to the original mosaic distribution, three. Now you caught that. Freeing of all slaves, canceling of all debt, and all the land that your family originally was allotted returns back to you. I'm telling you, listen, I don't know about you, if you was in... Man, you talk about a reason to dance. Let me, let me shake you up. I need to shake you up before I give you the good news. You know where the scripture says, owe no man nothing, but what? Okay, now most people think that that is you should not get a loan. It don't mean nothing to that. It doesn't even reference about you getting a loan. You say, okay, pastor, so it don't reference that. What does it mean? Think about it for a moment. Oh, no man, nothing. I want you to think. I want you to think. Who have you not paid back? Did y'all hear what I just said? Who have you not paid back? If you had a loan and you just paid no attention to the letters, no attention to anything, and you've not paid them back, I can guarantee you that has a bearing on your finances. Yes, you know why? Because when the Bible says, owe no man nothing, it is meaning it, it doesn't have anything to do with you getting a loan. It has everything to do with you not paying what you owe. Yes. And I, I come to tell you, now listen to me. I got a better plan for you at tax time. Instead of you waiting for your lump sum, why don't you fix your taxes where you can enjoy that every month? And, and, and come this tax season, maybe get $100 or $200, but enjoy your money. Because trust me, somebody else is enjoying it. That's right. 
I'm, I'm telling you, somebody else is enjoying your money. And you all excited about one time a year, I get a lump sum. I'm waiting on it. And you got plans for it already, and it hadn't happened. But I'm talking about, listen, when I caught a hold of this, I went straight to my office, HR office, when I was working in Allfield, and I went straight to them, and I said, okay, I need to calculate where I get about $50 back. They looked at me and said, hmm, what are you talking about? Well, let me show you what it, what it meant to me. Okay, in a month's time, I was short about $150 that I had to rob Peter to pay Paul. Okay. They took out of my taxes, et cetera. When I went to them and said, let's calculate this, $210 a month I was getting. Yep. More. Now, here I am struggling for 10 or 11 months waiting on a lump sum when every month I could be in the black. You, you, you see how the Babylonian system have us caught up? Mm, it, part of it was, but it, and, and my tax bracket. That, that, my tax bracket, you know, made good money in all field. See? See? And so, you know, when, when, when I went into the office, I told him, I said, Look, yeah, listen, I want to take out, you know, this amount so I can get something back. <laughs> until, until some truth came. Now, now, listen, I know what I'm talking about. That may be foreign to you. You see, it may be foreign to you because you never operated any other way. This is the way you've operated in years. I understand that because it happened to me when I first was introduced to it. But when I went sit down and I figured it out that I can be free 11 months, not wrestling with Peter and wrestling with Paul or pay the one and don't pay this one and pay that one for 11 months and then wait for the big drop of money that I'm going to blow up anyway because I'm already undisciplined. Okay. Always remember this, guys. Sometimes when truth is being spoken to you, it seems very odd. It's odd. And it goes against what? If, if truth is being spoken to you and it has to do with your comfortability, you'll shun truth and stay comfortable. Are you listening to me? And you're not going to come out of that thing unless you're willing to be uncomfortable and brave the way of the truth. I'm not talking about a scheme. I'm talking about the truth. Yeah. Are you listening to me? Jubilee. Okay. Three ba I'm, I'm almost done. Three basic provisions. The freeing of all slaves, the cancellation of all debts, the return of all land according to the original Mosaic distribution. That was three, the, the three provisions of Jubilee. Now, here are five advantages of Jubilee. I want you to hear them. One, advantage number one, it would utterly do away with slavery. And I'm talking about slavery in the spirit and in the natural. See, see, I, I told you this, and I don't know, maybe, maybe y'all had your ears turned off. God is against slavery and domination in his creation. He's against that. You listening to me? I mean, look in the Bible. I mean, come on. The big story, we preach it all the time about being delivered out of Egypt. About like with Balaam, Balaam. Uh, the, the king Balak went to get him to curse God's people, but they were blessed. And then the people made a decision to go whoring after the women of Moab. And why? When they did that, when they did that, they went into bondage because sin will do that. But if you, if you hang out with God, he is going to cause you to be free and have liberty all the time. Five advantages. It'll do away with slavery. Number two, it prevented inequalities which are produced by extreme riches or poverty. Now, this is not socialism, okay? Socialism try to work and everybody have the same thing, okay? This is not, God's system is not socialism, okay? 
But, but this jubilee factor prevents inequalities which are produced by extreme riches or poverty, which made one man domineer over the other man. Jesus talked about it in the New Testament when he talked about who is your Lord and etc. that don't the rich try to dominate the poor. Now, if I really get into economics with you, I give you this understanding that every society that does not have a middle class brings people under bondage. A middle class. You say, well, Pastor, I don't understand that. Why, Why the middle class? Because the middle class is in between the poor and the rich, and they are the ones that, that get into society, that help people, and that give. If, if you take a poll to try to find out who gives the most money, who donates the most money, yeah, rich people that are convinced and convicted by the Lord, but mostly it's going to be people in the middle class. I want you to think, every country you can think about that have poor and rich, they're in a bind. Mexico doesn't have a middle class. You either in the drug cartels with plenty of money or you are you out with a hut somewhere trying to grow groceries. No middle class, but no no prosperity because because of the way things have been set up and and how they're not open for liberty. The rich are having a mindset that I have confidence in my money. The poor are sitting on the side whining about what they don't have. The middle class is working to go forward. You're listening to me. Jubilee renounce that. Let's just say me and Callan right here. Sis Callan, we're right here. We're in it. Sis Callan's got all this land, all this money. See? And Crystal is our daughter. And, and so here comes, here comes the Jubilee year. Okay, here it comes. Now, all the land that Sis Callan has, she's got to give it up. All her slaves, she's got to give them up. Are, are, you, are you hearing me? You, you, can you feel the shift? Three, it prevented the accumulation of land on the part of a few. Land is important. God ain't making no more land. Of course, unless you're down in Hawaii where the volcanoes are spewing out, you know, and making rock, but he ain't making no more land. What God gave the people, that's what they have. That's three. Four, it rendered it impossible for anyone to be born in absolute poverty. Since everyone had his hereditary land. Are you listening to me? I am convinced that, you know, Jesus said the poor you always have with you. But they're only poor for a time. Are y'all listening to me? Five. It would afford a fresh opportunity to those who were reduced by adverse circumstances. And otherwise, events happen in our lives. But what Jubilee does is present you an opportunity to come out. That the condition you're in, you might be low now, but in Jubilee, you're coming out. Coming out. Mm -hmm. Coming out. You'll be able to work and, and work and get what you need. See, the Bible has a complete process of you gaining uh, in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Now you, you, listen, you have to go forward. You have to go forward. Now, last statement. Jesus, the last statement he had, he said, I've come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The jubilee year for everybody that trusts in and receive the ministry that I'm dealing with them in. Amen. 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 Now, there's a time of jubilee coming for us. I'm talking about freedom. Right, come on, guys. Think about it. I want you to go home and think about this. Think about this. That, that right now, you don't, you don't have nothing. But jubilee year comes, and what your family had, 
you get it back. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd be excited about that. What? No, it don't matter who holds the money. The money comes to the person in charge. You just, we'll deal with you later. It don't matter. It don't matter. When you start dealing with Jubilee, see, it, it renounces all this stuff in your heart of accumulation and et cetera, and it gets you back to God's purpose. And it don't matter who holds the money. Amen. Amen. Ah, it says Callan, says Callan. Shh. Just stay where you are. You're all right. Stand to your feet with me. 